Okay, I agree for 15 minutes, then you will have to let me kiss your hand. Charlie knows how hopeless his case is. But such is infatuation for Eustacia that he doesn't mind disregarding the whole thing. That it doesn't matter. He, he knows it doesn't matter, but that doesn't matter to him. Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. We are continuing with our series on the region of the native and today in this video we are going to be looking at the second book, The Arrival. As in case of tragic structures, uh, we see that this second book happens to give us some rising action where the characters about whom we have already known some things, they come in close interaction with each other and most important of all, we have been looking forward to meeting Klimio Bright, whom we will meet in the second book. Don't skip anything in this video because I'm going to only look at most important sections, focusing on important turns of events, dialogues, conversations, and the setup which is built by Hardy in his book. This is Monami Mukherjee and I welcome you all once again. The second book begins with the chapter Tidings of the Kamar. Now, in the first book, we already have known that uh, Klimio Bright is supposed to come to Egden Heath. So, of course, this uh, Kamar here refers to Klimio Bright, and we will look at uh, certain passages where this reference is uh, reiterated. This starts in the house of Eustacia Y. She hears a conversation between her grandfather and a native of Egden, and then Hardy writes, The subject of their discourse had been keenly interesting to her. So they were discussing about Clemio Bright and the fact that he was returning from Paris. A young and clever man was coming into that lonely heath from, of all contrasting places in the world, Paris. So why is Klim's arrival so important? Not just because he is an outsider, but he is coming from a place which represents everything that Egden is not. It's a place full of excitement, of activity, uh, of human interaction. So Egden, which represents boredom for Eustacia, is set at complete opposite to Paris from where Klim is coming. More singular still, the heathmen had instinctively coupled her and this man together in their minds as a pair born for each other. So this idea that she might uh, match up with him, this idea first started in her mind from this conversation which she overheard. That five minutes of overhearing furnished Eustacia with visions enough to fill the whole blank afternoon and then she went on dreaming. She is very imaginative and she went on dreaming such sudden alternations from mental vacuity. So earlier she had this vacuum inside her mind. It was mental vacuity. Do sometimes occur thus quietly. She could never have believed in the morning that her colorless inner world would before night become as animated as water under a microscope and that without the arrival of a single visitor. So nobody has yet arrived but her whole world has kind of dramatically transformed and now she is thinking about uh, happy things and is out of her depression already. And what does she do? She put on her bonnet and leaving the house, descended the hill on the side towards Bloom's End. Bloom's End is the address of Clay Mewbright's house. So she is uh, trying to have a glance at that house from far. Where she walked slowly along the valley for a distance of a mile and a half. This brought her to a spot in which the green bottom of the dale began to widen the first bushes, that is uh, the vegetation there, to recede yet further from the path on each side till they were diminished to an isolated one here and there by the increasing fertility of the soil. So while she is walking from her house, which is at Mistover Nap, she is going towards Bloom's End, 
we see a change of vegetation and Hardy doesn't use these details in vain. He is trying to give us some suggestions here. So does this mean that Bloom's end represents a more fertile uh, landscape whereas Miss Tover Knapp is more like barren in this case and wild? And then we have this uh, beautiful scene behind the white Palings was a little garden. Behind the garden, an old irregular thatched house facing the heath and commanding a full view of the valley. This was the obscure removed spot to which was about to return a man whose latter life had been passed in the French capital, the center and vortex of the fashionable world. Such long sentences you have in Hardy. So, when you have a very long sentence, as I also uh, told you in case of Milton, you need to break them up, those sentences, into small phrases and clauses and then try to understand what he's trying to say. So, what he's trying to say is that there is this house which is waiting for a man who is coming from uh, the center of activity, the hub of civilization from Paris. Okay. So, Somehow, this whole first chapter, it adds on to the anticipation. The comer has not yet arrived and it is simply giving us some more input from people around what they are feeling about Klim's arrival. Second chapter shows us people at Bloom's End where Klim would stay, his house. And people at Bloom's End mean Mrs. Yobright and Thomas in Yobright. Uh, Thomas in Yobright is cousin to Klim and Mrs. Yobright always wanted Thomasine uh, to get married to Klim but then now that Thomasine is in love with Damon Wildeev, Mrs. Yobright thinks that it is more fitting for her to get married to Damon because otherwise it would be a shameful thing in the eyes of society. Now earlier in the previous book we had that scene where Mrs. Yobright was telling Wildeev that there is some other man who is trying to win the affection of Thomasin and that made Wildeev uh, think that okay then I'll go with Eustacia and he goes and informs Eustacia. Eustacia in turn rejects Wildeev because she now feels that Wildeev's value has diminished now that Thomasin is no longer interested in Wildeev and eventually that makes Wildeev come back to Thomasin. So that was the kind of flow chart of events that we were witnessing in the previous book. Now, when Mrs. Yeo Bright informs Thomasin of this uh, little bit of manipulation on her part, uh, we'll see her reaction. What did you tell him? That he was standing in the way of another lover of yours. Aunt, what do you mean? So, Thomasin is kind of shocked that uh, her aunt is actually manipulating a man into marrying her. So that is kind of disgraceful because she feels that it uh, humiliates her position uh, because a man should uh, voluntarily marry her, uh, not forced by these manipulations. So she is not very happy about this. Don't be alarmed. It was my duty. I can say no more about it now. Mrs. Yo Bright doesn't want to continue the topic. But when it is over, I will tell you exactly what I said and why I said it. Thomasin was perforce content and she wants Mrs. Yeo Bright not to tell Clem anything about this postponement of marriage or this whole thing that has happened between her and Wildiff, okay, because she doesn't want somehow Clem to know. And you will keep the secret of my would-be marriage from claim for the present? She next asked. I've given my word to, but what is the use of it? He must soon know what has happened. A mere look at your face will show him that something is wrong. Evidently, Klim and Thomasin, they were uh, pretty close to each other. And uh, so, Klim would really understand that something was wrong in her life. So, Mrs. Yobright thinks that what's the point of hiding things from him? Anyway, uh, this is a little insignificant other than the fact that people at Bloom Center are getting ready, the woman at Mr. Vanap is getting ready and now we come back to Eustacia Wai and how uh, she finally reacts to a very small incident. 
this incident was important to her because this was the first time Clemio Bright actually spoke to her without knowing who she is, without even looking at her. So Eustacia chanced to come upon three people who were walking down and one of them was Clem who was coming home with his family and there he didn't even recognize her or look at her. He simply uh, curtsied and just greeted her uh, because it was evening time and he moved on. But that phrase stuck with her as if that started or triggered something in her. The three voices passed on and decayed and died out upon her ear. Thus much had been granted her. She is feeling that this is all she gets now. And all besides withheld, nothing else is given to her except that very formal passing curtsy, a gesture of a stranger. No event could have been more exciting. During the greater part of the afternoon, she had been entrancing herself by imagining the fascination which must attend a man come direct from beautiful Paris. So this man is not just a man anymore. He is like an emissary. He is like a representative being from the land of enchantment, Paris. And it happens, you know, when you don't go to a place and you just have all your life dreamt about a place being the epitome of freedom, of liberty, of action, of adventure, then you begin to imagine more than the place actually is. So I don't know what Eustacia would have felt if she uh, had gone to Paris. I'm very sure she would remain as depressed, would uh, be as inactive and would be as bored, but that she hasn't been there. That is making Paris more alluring for her. Okay, this happens. Hard melodies are sweet, but those on hard are sweeter. That's from Keats. On such occasions as this, a thousand ideas pass through a highly charged woman's head. And Eustacia is very imaginative. I repeatedly tell this. And they indicate themselves on her face. But the changes, though actual, are minute. But nobody can actually see uh, those changes on her face other than the fact that maybe she glowed a bit but her imagination was running wild. Nothing of it was reflected outside and Hardy gives us a succession of changes in her. She glowed, remembering the mendacity of the imagination. She flagged, then she freshened, then she fired, then she cooled again. It was a cycle of aspects produced by a cycle of visions and this man had greeted her. So somehow this one phrase that this man had uttered becomes the center of her imagination and her imagination runs so wild uh, that she actually wants to go and talk to this man and she goes over to her grandfather and asks him why don't they have any interaction with the Eubrites? Now after all these years she's asking this. Why is it that we are never friendly with the Eubrites? She said coming forward and stretching her soft hands over the warmth. I wish we were. They seem to be very nice people. The grandfather is simply not interested. Be hanged if I know why. I like the old man well enough. Old man means Mr. Eubright when he lived. Uh, he was on friendly terms with Captain Y. Though he was as rough as a hedge, but you would never have cared to go there, even if you might have, I am well sure. Why shouldn't I? So he says that they are not the kind of people uh, who you would like. So I don't know, even if I had good terms with the Eubrights, you wouldn't go there. And she's asking, why shouldn't I? Your town taste would find them far too countrified. So grandfather, why? He knows that uh, Eustacia is refined and she loves uh, sophistication, which is found in urban places. And your brides are uh, more in tune with uh, Egden Heath and nature around. Especially we see this reflected in the character of Thomasin and even Mrs. Eubright. They are very much at peace with Egden. They are not rebelling against it. 
this is something which uh, the captain thinks would uh, not allow Eustachia to mix with them easily. They sit in the kitchen, drink mead and elder wine and sand the float to keep it clean. A sensible way of life, but how would you like it? I thought Mrs. Yobright was a ladylike woman, a curate's daughter, was she not? Yes, but she was obliged to live as her husband did, and I suppose she has taken kindly to it by this time. Ah, I recall that I once accidentally offended her, and I never have seen her since. So there had been some incident which we are not given any details of, uh, where Captain Vi had a problem with Mrs. Eubright. Maybe he made a passing comment or something, because we know that Captain Vi is uh, not very refined in his speech. He shows unnecessary curiosity, uh, makes judgment, passes comments. So maybe he had an, uh, a kind of incident with Mrs. Eobright after which uh, he is not on very friendly terms with Eobrights. So uh, long matter short, Mr. Knapp is detached from Bloomsend. But Eustachia's brain is not ready to accept it. At night, she starts to have a dream. What dream does she have? She was dancing to wondrous music and her partner was the man in silver armor. Now this idea of silver armor, who wears a silver armor? Uh, those uh, age old knights who come and rescue ladies in distress, uh, damsels in distress and Eustachia, although she is a very strong and powerful uh, personality, strong and powerful in the sense uh, more like obstinate and um, you can say root, uh, but in her dream she likes to imagine herself as a damsel in distress and a knight in shining armor would come and rescue her and we can very well understand who this knight in shining armor is for her. Right now it is none other than Clemio Bright. But she hasn't seen Clem's face in the evening uh, twilight so of course in her dream she cannot dream up the face. So she is imagining that uh, this knight-like person is dancing with her, wearing a, an armor whose face is not visible. The visor of his helmet being closed. So the helmet flap is closed. The mazes of the dance were ecstatic. Soft whispering came into her ear from under the radiant helmet and she felt like a woman in paradise. Suddenly, these two wheeled out from the mass of dancers. So they, they simply went away from the crowd dancing together, dived into one of the pools of the heath and came out somewhere into an iridescent hollow. So in dreams, you know, you do these things, you know, you jump into a pool and you come out and everything happens so fast. She is going on dreaming this, that she is going on this expedition with this knight, arched with rainbows. It must be here, said the voice by her side. And blushingly looking up, she saw him removing his cusk to kiss her. At that moment, there was a cracking noise and his figure fell into fragments like a pack of cards. So right at the moment when he was about to kiss her, trying to remove his helmet, then the dream broke. Of course, the dream broke because she didn't have any idea about how Klim looks like. Those were not days of Facebook profile images and Instagram DPs. So she didn't have any idea how Klim looks like. Of course, the dream has to break. And look at her uh, expression after that. She cried aloud, oh, that I had seen his face. She knows that if she had seen his face the previous night, then she could dream it. And then she would feel more fulfilled. So this is a very imaginative woman who thinks that she can actually manipulate her dreams too. Not satisfied with only dreaming about Klim, she has to do something about it. And when she's thinking about what can be done, what can be done, and she's getting more and more frustrated because she cannot um, find a way to reach this man, then something happened and this happens in chapter 4. Eustachia is led on to an adventure. Eustachia was sitting at her house when a boy comes in. Who is there? said Eustachia. Please, Captain Vi, will you let us? Eustachia arose and went to the door. I cannot allow you to come in so boldly. You should have waited. The captain said I might come in without any fuss. 
So the boy who had come, he has come for some purpose and the captain or Eustachia's grandfather had already allowed that. So now he is simply asking permission to get in. So what has he come for? Oh, did he? Uh, what do you want, Charlie? So the name of this boy is Charlie. Please, uh, will your grandfather lend us his fuel house to try over our parts in tonight at 7 o'clock? So they want to rehearse something. What, are you one of the Egden mummers for this year? Yes, miss. The captain used to let the old mummers practice here. So they are going to have a kind of a performance, mummers show. And they want to practice at Eustachia's house. Why? Because this house location is uh, almost central to um, their uh, individual houses. So it's easier for them to come and gather here. Plus, they have this space available here, which is not available everywhere. I know it, yes. You may use the full house if you like, said Eustachia languidly. Then, while they were practicing, Eustachia came to know that they're going to have this performance at Bloom's End, that is Claim Your Bride's house. Eustachia's face flagged. There was to be a party at the Yobrites. She naturally had nothing to do with it because there was no connection between Mr. Van Nap and Blooms and nobody invited her. She was a stranger to all such local gatherings. In any case, she avoided these kinds of parties. She hated them and had always held them as scarcely appertaining to her sphere. But had she been going, what an opportunity would have been afforded her of seeing the man. But if she had the opportunity to go, then she could make the best of it. Whose influence was penetrating her like summer sun. To increase that influence was coveted excitement. To cast it off might be to regain serenity. To leave it as it stood was tantalizing. So this is how Hardy writes. You know, he gives you the same expression over again, using synonyms, trying to give various shades of emotions. But he loves to dwell on Eustacia's feelings whenever he can. The lads and men prepared to leave the premises and Eustacia returned to her fireside. And then she calls Charlie when Charlie was about to leave. The lad was surprised. He entered the front room, not without blushing, for he, like many, had felt the power of this girl's face and form. He, like many, had felt. That means Eustacia was uh, something of a common interest. Uh, she generated a lot of curiosity and admiration. Charlie was infatuated by her. So he comes. She pointed to a seat by the fire and entered the other side of the chimney corner herself. And then she starts talking. Which part do you play, Charlie, the Turkish knight? Do you not? Inquired the beauty, looking across the smoke of the fire to him on the other side. Eustacia knows how to manipulate people around her, especially men. She knows uh, the kind of angles she should look at the kind of uh, directions uh, she should sit at to make the best use of her features and Charlie is so naive so innocent it's very easy for her to somehow get him in her grip yes miss the Turkish knight he replied diffidently is yours a long part nine speeches about can you repeat them to me if so I should like to hear them and then he goes on repeating his lines. And he continues till the part where St. George, after whom this uh, play is named, St. George strikes him, kills him and he falls. Okay, that is the end of the Turkish night. Eustacia had occasionally heard the part recited before. When the lad ended, she began precisely in the same words and ranted on without hitch or divergence till she too reached the end. So she could very well uh, tell everything that Charlie said and it was already etched in her memory. But it was different. It was the same thing, yet how different, like in form. It had the added softness and finish of a Raphael after Perugino, which 
while faithfully reproducing the original subject entirely distances the original art. So the way Eustacia spoke was very different from Charlie, although she spoke the same lines. Now Hardy is again, I'm telling you, he, he completely loses it when he talks about Eustacia and goes on using so much of imagery here. Eustacia speaks to Charlie. Would you let me play your part for one night? Always. But your woman's gown, you couldn't. I can get boy's clothes. At least all that would be wanted besides the mumming dress. What should I have to give you to lend me your things? To let me take your place for an hour or two on Monday night? And on no account to say a word about who or what I am. So she wants to take Charlie's part on one single night and then she wants Charlie to be silent about it. You would of course have to excuse yourself from playing that night and to say that somebody, a cousin of Miss Weiss, would act for you. She doesn't want anybody to know that it's she who is acting there. The other mummers have never spoken to me in their lives so that it would be safe enough and if it were not, I should not mind. Now, what must I give you to agree to this half a crown? So she wants to give him some money. The youth shook his head. Five shillings? He shook his head again. Money won't do it, he said, brushing the iron head of the fire dog with his hollow of his hand. Money won't do it. What would then? What will then, Charlie? said Eustacia in a disappointed tone. You know what you forbid me at the Maypoling, miss? Now this Maypole festival is a time when men and women, they dance together, they hold hands together. And in some Maypole festival, maybe Charlie wanted to hold her hands and she did not allow him. So he's referring to that incident. Yes, you wanted to join hands with me in the ring, if I recollect. Half an hour of that and I'll agree, miss. So if you let me hold your hand for half an hour, I'll agree. Look at the negotiations here. Affections and negotiations. Do they go in hand in hand? I don't know. Everything happens with Eustacia here. Half an hour of what? Holding her hand in mine. Make it a quarter of an hour. That's like extreme bargaining here. Yes, Miss Eustacia, I will. If I may kiss it too. Okay. I agree for 15 minutes. Then you will have to let me kiss your hand. Charlie knows how hopeless his case is. But such is infatuation for Eustacia that he doesn't mind disregarding the whole thing. That it doesn't matter. He knows it doesn't matter. But that doesn't matter to him. Now later, something funny happens. Charlie arranges for everything that she needs. And then she has to let him hold her hand for 15 minutes. Charlie doesn't hold her hand for 15 minutes. He... Uh, stands with her and then when six or eight minutes have passed Charlie says this I think I won't use it all up tonight it's as if he has got this coupon which we get and we redeem some part of it keep some part for future or some voucher that he has got from Eustacia gift voucher of holding her hand so he doesn't want to use all 15 minutes in a single day he is only taking six to eight minutes today to ensure that he has this pleasure again in some near future. May I have the other few minutes another time? As you like, said she without the least emotion. Look at the cruelty here. She is using this innocence of this, I would say child. Charlie is a child here because if he is not a child, why is he behaving like a child? He's a teenage boy and she's using him. And she's so devoid of emotion. And she's expecting to build a relationship with the man. And she thinks that that relationship is going to end her troubles. But she doesn't understand the basic ingredient of a relationship. And that is emotion. But it must be over in a week. And then later, when everything is arranged, Charlie wants an additional moment, like a bonus. 
Yes, miss, but I think I'll have one minute more of what I'm owed, if you don't mind. Eustacia gave him her hand as before. One minute. So she gives him permission to hold her hand for one minute, but intentionally lets him hold it for more than that time. And counted on till she reached seven or eight minutes hand and person, she then withdrew to a distance of several feet as if he's an untouchable. You want one minute, you take five and just, just get out of here. That's her expression. The contract completed, she raised between them a barrier, impenetrable as a wall. There, it's all gone. And I didn't mean quite all. So Charlie thinks that he has used up all his vouchers, vouchers of holding Eustacia's hand. So this brings us to the fifth chapter through the moonlight. Eustacia goes with the mummers and she is recognized. There was a whispered conversation between three or four of them. She was going with these other performers and one turned to her. Will you tell us one thing? He said, not without gentleness, in a very gentle way, he said. Do you miss why? We think you must be. So, she is recognizable and they have recognized her. You may think what you like, but honorable lads will not tell tales upon a lady. So, she is again trying to manipulate situation here. And she convinces this person that he should not tell others that she is Eustacia Vai. We'll say nothing, miss. That's upon our honor. Thank you, she replied. And they're very happy. They're, they're having this exceptional experience of having a woman performer, especially Eustacia Vai, as their co-performer in a mummer. Why should they tell people? Uh, they will definitely tell people later, but not tonight. They don't want this to stop. Now, that performance started. Klim was there. Everybody was there. And Eustacia was playing this Turkish knight who dies at the end. So when she finally receives a death blow, she starts dying gradually. And Hadi makes a very humorous comment here. This gradual sinking to the earth, in fact, was one reason why Eustacia had thought that the part of the Turkish knight, though not the shortest, would suit her best. A direct fall from upright to horizontal, which was the end of the other fighting characters, was not an elegant or decorous part for a girl. Now, why she chose this character? Because uh, there were many characters in this performance. Most of them die. And when they die, they simply fall. That is their part. They get stabbed. They fall from standing position directly uh, to a prostrate position. But this Turkish knight dies gradually. And that would give her some, you know, elegance. So, Eustacia is so bothered about how she would appear that she is thinking about how she would appear even when she is disguised as a man. So, this woman is obsessed with appearance. About how her elegance is maintained. How decorum is maintained. All right. So, after Eustacia is flat on the floor because she is dead, the Turkish knight is dead. Eustacia was now among the number of the slain, the characters who are killed, though not on the floor for she had managed to sink into a sloping position against the clock case. So when she was gradually falling, she tilted herself against a structure, a clock case so that her head was well elevated. So, she was lying like this and she could see people. Okay, that was her whole point. If she would fall on the floor, she cannot look at people. So, she wants to see who the uh, invitees were in the party, especially claim. So, she was looking at everybody. The play proceeded between St. George, the Saracen, the Doctor and Father Christmas and Eustacia. Having no more to do, for the first time found leisure to observe the scene around and to search for the form that had drawn her hither. So she goes on watching and looking for him. Next chapter, the two stand face to face. 
It was, however, not with those who sat in the settle that Eustacia was concerned. A face showed itself with marked distinctness against the dark tanned wood of the upper part. The owner, who was leaning against the settle's outer end, was Clement Eubright or Klim, as he was called here. So, what is the full name of Klim? Clement. Many people don't know this, but now that you have seen this video, you would be able to surprise people. The full name of Clim Eubright is Clement Eubright. And then Hardy goes on to describe Klim's face in details and he ends up telling us this, that he has a, a unique combination of looks. As for his look, it was a natural cheerfulness, striving against depression from without. So, on one hand, it was a melancholic face. On the other hand, it was a cheerful face. And it was as if there was a struggle between the two. So, there was Egden in his face and there was Paris in his face. And that is the main problem here. Klim offered you Paris if you wanted to see Paris in him. Klim offered you Egden if you wanted to see Egden in him. There was this duality, this conflict. And at the same time, a kind of philosophical, uh, you can say, sensitivity. It's something which we don't see described in case of wild deaf. As is usual with bright natures, the deity that lies ignominiously chained within an ephemeral human carcass shone out of him like a ray. It's as if he contained within him a divinity. And because his body was like this human structure, that divinity was uh, a kind of glowing out of him like a ray, like a halo. So you see how Eustacia is described as a goddess, Claim is described as divine. Uh, so what is Hardy doing here? He's elevating these characters to a kind of stature where uh, their union is foreshadowed in these expressions and at the same time, uh, we feel that it's not always for glorification that poets or writers deify their women. Well, Pope called Belinda a goddess too, didn't he? I find a similar kind of slanted humor in Hardy. Although his worst enemies wouldn't call him humorous. But this tendency to deify a woman character only to reveal her weakness. This is something which is very common too. After the performance, Klim wanted to attend to the performers and uh, because she was wearing this helmet, she couldn't eat anything. So he offers her some wine which she can manage to drink with her helmet on, with her cover on. Um, at moments during this performance, Eustacia was half in doubt about the security of her position. She always felt that people would uh, somehow recognize her. Yet it had a fearful joy. A series of attentions paid to her and yet not to her but to some imaginary person. Now she was not Eustacia here. So it was very weird for her because people were paying attention to her but not to her. By the first band she had ever been inclined to adore complicated her emotions indescribably and she had these very unique feelings. She had loved him. Now Hardy is giving us reasons why Eustacia chose Klim. She had loved him partly because he was exceptional in this scene because uh, he was an arrival here. He was not what she uh, was habituated to see on Egden. So he was something new. The novelty of his arrival uh, was exceptional. Partly because she had determined to love him, like she has already decided before even meeting him that she would love him and she is very obstinate. Chiefly because she was in desperate need of loving somebody after wearing of Wild Eve. She has to replace Wild Eve. So these are her motivations. Number one, Klim is unique uh, on Egden. Number two, she wants to love him. And number three, she wants to somehow replace Wild Eve. So these are the clear reasons why Eustacia chooses Klim. And that is not very flattering. There is no love at first sight, no honesty, uh, no impulse here. It's all 
manipulation and she is manipulating herself into feeling that this man is going to save her from the boredom of Acton. Now while she was there something else happened. She heard Thomasin and Klim talking to each other and somehow uh, she started to have some jealous feelings towards Thomasin. Especially when she heard that or she understood that Thomasin does not want to tell Klim about her wedding uh, mismanagement or fiasco. Um, and somehow, as I was telling you, she is very bothered about appearances. What is she wearing now? She is wearing an armor, dressed like a Turkish knight. She is not wearing a gown, nothing feminine. So all her beauty, all her graces are hidden. And she witnesses Thomasin, who is dressed like she should be as a woman, talking to Klim. And she feels that somehow she has lost this opportunity of showing who is more beautiful. So there's a competition growing here, strangely. Eustacia was nettled by her own contrivances. What a sheer waste of herself to be dressed thus, while another was shining to advantage. So Thomasin was having advantage of being able to showcase her feminine beauty. Had she known the full effect of the encounter, she would have moved heaven and earth to get here in a natural manner. If she knew this would happen, she would never come like a Turkish knight. She would come like a woman dressed elegantly. The power of her face all lost, the charm of her emotions all disguised. Emotions, and she is talking about emotions here anyway. She thinks she has emotions. The fascinations of her coquetry denied existence. Nothing but a voice left to her. Nobody here respects me. And she wants to go out of this place. And while she moves out, she hears footsteps and she turns and sees Klim standing. Are you a woman or am I wrong? He directly asks her. I'm a woman. This is the last chance she has. She has to show that she's a woman. Klim thinks that she's a woman and uh, it's okay being a woman. She might perform in a play because he's from Paris. Things are not unusual there where women play uh, these parts. Do girls often play as mummers now? They never used to. They don't now. Why did you? To get excitement and shake off depression. What depressed you? Life. So she's trying to be melodramatic here. That's a cause of depression a good many have to put up with. So yes, so many people are depressed about life. That's nothing unusual. Yes. And then Klim asks that you came here for excitement, you're saying. So did you find it? And do you find excitement? At this moment, perhaps. See how she is enchanting him. That she was not excited till now, but now that she is talking to this man, this man is making her feel excited. So she knows how to engage a man's attention. And she is doing that. Then you are vexed at being discovered. Yes, though I thought I might be. I would gladly have asked you to our party had I known you wished to come. If I knew that you wanted to attend my party, you didn't have to come in this disguise. I would have invited you. Have I ever been acquainted with you in my youth? Never. Won't you come in again and stay as long as you like? No, I wish not to be further recognized. So this is a strategy. She is pulling and pushing him at the same time to create a kind of interest in him. Because if she uh, shows too much eagerness, she might lose value in his eyes according to her. So she is uh, balancing between interest and disinterest. Well, you are safe with me. That means I'm not going to tell anybody. I will not intrude upon you longer. It is a strange way of meeting and I will not ask why I find a cultivated woman playing such a part as this. So, Klim is amused and definitely hooked on to this woman. Because for Klim also, what are the choices here? What choices does he have here? Thomasin, getting married to somebody else. The native women, well, no matter how much he admires them, likes them, 
they would never be his companion. So this woman provides an intellectual, uh, you can say, challenge to him, which he definitely cannot ignore. Now, when Eustacia was coming back, she remembers that this was the time and place uh, where she had made an appointment with Wildeev and she missed that and Wildeev must have come. She herself had fixed the evening and the hour. He had probably come to the spot, waited there in the cold and been greatly disappointed. Well, so much the better. It did not hurt him, she said serenely. Wildeev had at present the rayless outline of the sun through smoked glass. So Wildeev is no more the god here. Look at these expressions, rayless outline of the sun through smoked glass, so foggy. Wildeev doesn't create the kind of excitement in her anymore. She has already replaced him. And she really wants Thomasin out of the picture and says, Oh, that she had been married to Damon before this. And she would if it hadn't been for me. If I had only known, if I had only known. And she thinks that if she didn't stop Wildeev, she didn't influence Wildeev, then Wildeev would have got married to Thomasin by now and she would have a very safe and secure affair with Klim without Thomasin hanging there. Eustacia once more lifted her deep stormy eyes to the moonlight and sighing that tragic sigh of hers which was so much like a shudder entered the shadow of the roof. So there she is brooding again. And in chapter 7 we have a coalition between beauty and oddness. Uh, let me explain to you who the beauty here represents and who oddness is. Beauty is of course Eustacia Y. Oddness who other than Redelman. There is an interaction between Eustacia and Redelman where De Griven, the little man, he tells Eustacia that he knows Wildeev's disappointment the other night when she did not keep her appointment. Mr. Wildeev stayed at Red Barrow a long time waiting for a lady who didn't come. So he's not direct here, but he clearly tells her that he knows. You waited too, it seems. Yes, I always do. I was glad to see him disappointed. He will be there again tonight to be again disappointed. So Eustacia keeps on telling him that she is not going to be with Wildeev. The truth is, Redelman, that, that lady, so far from wishing to stand in the way of Thomasin's marriage with Mr. Wildeev, would be very glad to promote it. So the lady, that is herself, who did not want Wildeef to marry Thomasin, actually wants Wildeef to marry Thomasin now. Verent was very surprised. Eustacia talks to him about how she can get rid of Wildeef. I wish I knew what to do. I don't want to be uncivil to him, but I don't wish to see him again. So Eustacia knows that since they had a relationship earlier, it would be difficult for her to be rude to him and she fears that they might relapse into the same old position again uh, and she really doesn't want that anymore. So she wants to avoid meeting Wildeev, but she somehow has to tell him to be away from her. So she wants some suggestions from Ven. But I don't wish to see him again and I have some few little things to return to him. Some tokens of lovers. If you choose to send him by me, miss, and a note to tell him that you wish to say no more to him, I'll take it for you quite privately. That would be the most straightforward way of letting him know your mind. Very well, come towards my house and I'll bring it out to you. So, Wildeev standing at the same place because he thinks Eustacia will come, but Eustacia doesn't come. Little man comes holding a letter and he comes and says, the meeting is always at 8 o'clock at this place and here we are, we three. We three, said Wildeev, looking quickly around, but she can only see Diggeryven. There is no Eustacia, so why is he saying we three? Yes. You and I and she. This is she. He held up the letter and parcel. So whatever Eustacia sent 
but while div is displayed in front of him. I don't quite see what this means. How do you come here? There must be some mistake. Wild Leaf cannot understand how Eustachia gets connected with Degriven. Okay, it will be cleared from your mind when you have read the letter, lanterns for one. Who are you? So, Wild Leaf is totally bamboozled here. He, first of all, doesn't properly know Riddleman. He doesn't know how Eustachia is connected to Riddleman and why is this man giving this parcel which contains things that should be between him and Eustachia. You are the little man I saw on the hill this morning. Why? You are the man who... Now he remembers that this is the man who brought Thomas in back. So, okay, this man is interested. Okay, this man might be the suitor. So, now he is thinking all that and whatever he is thinking, Hardy doesn't tell us. Please read the letter. He reads the letter and his face grows serious. What is written there? Let's read that. To Mr. Wildeef, Eustachia writing to Damon Wildeef. To Mr. Wildeef, look at the salutation here. After some thought, I have decided once and for all, look at the finality here, that we must hold no further communication. The more I consider the matter, the more I am convinced that there must be an end to our acquaintance. Had you been uniformly faithful to me throughout these two years, you might now have some ground for accusing me of heartlessness. Since you were kind of in and out of this relationship, so you can't tell that I am heartless. So she is giving all her reasons here. But if you calmly consider what I bore during the period of your desertion, the way I felt when you left, and how I passively put up with your courtship of another without once interfering. You will, I think, own that I have a right to consult my own feelings when you come back to me again. Since I kept quiet when you went away, I can do as I please now. That these are not what they were towards you may perhaps be a fault in me. But it is one which you can scarcely reproach me for when you remember how you left me for Thomason. So complicated language. I know back in those days people wrote these kinds of convoluted sentences. The point is you dumped me so I dump you and you don't get to question me. That is what the gist of the matter is. The little articles you gave me in the early part of our friendship are returned by the bearer of this letter. They should rightly have been sent back when I first heard of your engagement to her, Eustachia. So, that's it. That's like an end note, a goodbye letter, a breakup message. Full of this resolve to marry in haste and wring the heart of the proud girl while he went his way, while he was very angry. He thinks like, let her go to hell, I'll marry Thomason. Although Diggory Venn tried to uh, meet uh, people at Bloom's End to see if there's a chance Thomasin chooses him, but he sees that by the time he reaches that house, Wildiv had already been there and things are settled between them and they're going to be married. Man alive, you've been quick at it, said Diggory sarcastically. And you slow, as you will find, and you may as well go back again now. I have claimed her and got her. Good night, little man. Thereupon Wildiv walked away. Ven's heart sank within him, though it had not risen unduly high. He didn't hope that he would get Thomas in, but he still maybe hoped a little. But that hope completely dashed against this heartless monster. Firmness is discovered in a gentle heart, the eighth chapter, the final chapter of this book. Damon Wildiv had come to Bloom's End. And Thomasin informs her aunt that they are going to be married. Indeed, what? Is he anxious? Mrs. Eobright directed a searching look upon her niece. Why did not Mr. Wildiff come in? He did not wish to. You are not friends with him, he says. Thomasin knows that Mrs. Eobright doesn't approve of Wildiff, so she didn't want Wildiff to come and meet her. Wildiff didn't want to come too. He would like the wedding to be the day after tomorrow, quite privately at the church of his parish, not at ours. So they want or he wants this marriage or this wedding to be over soon. Oh, and what did you say? I agreed to it. 
I am a practical woman now. I don't believe in hearts at all. I would marry him under any circumstances since, since Klim's letter. So Klim is away. He'll come back. But while he's away, he uh, has heard rumors about Thomasin's um, failed wedding or wedding postponement. And uh, he feels that nobody has informed him anything. And he doesn't like this whole thing. So he writes a letter uh, asking them about the truth. So Thomasin feels that before Klim comes back to Egdon, she should get married. Yes, I decided that it ought to be over before he came. After that, you can look him in the face and so can I. Our concealments will matter nothing. So once I get married, maybe he'll not talk about why we did not tell him about the wedding cancellation and all that. Now, when there is a wedding, it happens in all cultures, you know. Somebody from the bride's family, uh, they offer the hand of the bride to the groom. It can be the bride's father, the mother, any parent, any guardian, um, any close acquaintance. So that is the usual case. It's like somebody offering the blessing as we have Kanyadan in um, Indian marriages. I don't know. That, that's a bit regressive ritual. Let's talk about that later. Um, but Mrs. Yobright wants to ask her, do you wish me to give you away? So do you want me to be the person who will give your hand to Damon in marriage as a ritual? I'm willing to undertake that, you know, if you wish. So Mrs. Yobright is making an effort uh, to accept things which she doesn't like because she thinks that this is for uh, the benefit of Thomas. And this is kind of, uh, you can say, very generous on her part, I would say, because she is uh, a person who has suffered in her life. From Captain Vi's words, we understand that she uh, belonged to a different kind of sophisticated life. And now because of her husband, she had to live this life in Egden. And she accepts that. And now she hates Wildy, but she accepts him. So all we see behind this stern outer, you can say facade of Mrs. Yo Bright is a very soft heart, very accepting heart, a very motherly heart. Okay. I don't think I will ask you to come. Thomasin knows that it will be difficult for Mrs. Yo Bright to be the person to give her away to Damon. So she wants to shield her aunt from that feeling. Thomasin is also very, very nice, sweet girl here. It would be unpleasant, I am almost sure. And yes, another thing is that Thomasin is bothered about how Wildy would feel about it. Thomasin is very frail and fragile, although she shows a lot of confidence sometimes, a um, lot of decision making sometimes, but she is nonetheless very frail. And we always feel like she needs to be protected. And then she says, I'm only your niece and there is no necessity why you should concern yourself more about me. Now, that's something harsh, you know, because uh, we have clearly understood that all her life, Mrs. Yobright has treated Thomasin as a daughter. So this expression is very, it sounds very ungrateful, but well, then we have this scene where uh, both of them, they're standing in the bedroom and Thomasin was getting ready for her wedding. The sun, where it could catch it, made a mirror of Thomasin's hair, which she always wore braided. Braided is uh, when you tie your hair. Okay, that's a braid. It was braided according to a calendar system. Now, Thomasin has this very frail, ritualistic way of dressing herself up, almost like Belinda, you can say. The more important the day, the more numerous the strands in the braid. So whenever a woman ties her hair, she makes different style of braiding. And depending on how important the occasion is, the number of uh, strands in the braid, they increased. On ordinary working days, she braided it in threes. On ordinary Sundays, in fours. 
May pollings, that May pole festival, earlier we have talked about it. Gypsying and the like, she bred in five. Years ago, she had said that when she married, she would braid it in sevens. She had braided it in sevens today. So, no matter how unflattering the circumstances be, how undecorated the wedding is, she feels that it's the most important day in her life. Uh, that is seen in the way she is tying up her hair. And when she is going away, you know, there is a pull from Mrs. Yobright. She feels like Mrs. Yobright is calling her back. Uh, a few steps further and she looked back. Did you call me, aunt? She tremulously inquired. Goodbye. Moved by an uncontrollable feeling as she looked upon Mrs. Yobright's worn, wet face, she ran back. When her aunt came forward and they met again, Oh, Tamsi, said the elder, weeping, I don't like to let you go. I, I am. Goodbye. Again, and went on. Then Mrs. Yobright saw a little figure wending its way between the scratching furze bushes and she, she sees her going away through that heathland. And then this expression, solitary and undefended. As I was telling you, she needs to be protected. Undefended, except by the power of her own hope. But the worst feature in this case was one which did not appear in the landscape. It was the man. So the worst thing that was happening to her was not any outer danger, but the very man with whom she was going to get married. While this wedding was going on, Klim returns. Okay, he was away for a short while. He returns and he really wants to go to that church and says Mrs. Yobrai that we should actually go. It doesn't matter what she thinks. We should go. We are our family. But uh, as he wants to go there, he realizes that it's too late because Riddleman comes in and informs them that the wedding is already over. Who was there? said Mrs. Yobright. So she wants to know about the guests who have attended that wedding. Nobody, hardly. I stood right out of the way and she did not see me. The Riddleman spoke huskily and looked into the garden. Who gave her away? Now, Mrs. Yobright wants to know about the person who offered Thomasin's hand to Damon. Who was that person? Because there was nobody from the family. Miss Vai, Eustacia Vai. How very remarkable. Miss Vai, it is to be considered an honor, I suppose. Obviously, this is said in an ironic manner. Klim doesn't know her yet. Who is Miss Vai? Captain Vai's granddaughter of Miss Tover Knapp. A proud girl from Budmouth, said Mrs. Yobright. One not much to my liking. People say she is a witch. But of course that is absurd. We straight away sense the disapproval in her voice. So does Clem. And funnily enough, when parents disapprove of a match, somehow things get more interesting for the children. Now, the last part in this book is about how Diggory Venn felt. From that instant of leaving Mrs. Eubright's door, Riddleman was seen no more in or about Edden Heath for a space of many months. He was very sad and he went away from that place. He vanished entirely. The nook among the brambles where his van had been standing was as vacant. Earlier, he had so much work, you know, watching over Eustacia and Wild Eve's meetings, seeing if Thomasin was okay. And now he doesn't have to do those things anymore. The report that Diggory had brought of the wedding, correct as far as it went, was deficient in one significant particular. Riddleman had informed them that Thomasin was wedded to uh, Damon and Eustacia had given her away. All right. So what detail did he miss? When Thomasine was tremblingly engaged in signing her name, so Thomasine was absorbed in that ritual, she was signing her name. 
Wild Eve had flung towards Eustacia a glance that said plainly, I have punished you now. It's as if Wild Eve was looking at Eustacia and telling that this is my revenge. She had replied in a low tone, and he little thought how truly. Your mistake. It gives me sincere pleasure to see her, your wife, today. This is how it ends between the two. They were like wild animals fighting for control. And even here, there is no sadness that they have lost something that was there between them. There was nothing there between them. Otherwise, they couldn't have been this challenging towards each other. And this emotional coldness that we see in Eustacia is alarming because we can forgive a lot of crimes and sins and shortcomings in our protagonists. But emotional coldness is something that we probably cannot tolerate much because that equates with inhumanity. So maybe we can still have some sympathies for Lady Macbeth, but how much can we sympathize with a woman who is using her own lack of emotion as a tool of manipulation? We will jump straight into the third book in our next video. I hope you are enjoying this series. If you do, please write that in the comment section. If you don't have this text in your syllabus but have any other Victorian novel, then I would still suggest you to go through this video series because Victorian fiction is a composite whole and you can have a complete idea about different uh, ways of expression that Victorian writers adopted only if you know about as many authors as you can. So I'll see you all very soon in my next video. Till then, stay happy, stay subscribed. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off.